as it is just about time, and this is a much longer deck than I anticipated. I'm just going to dig right into it. Um, hello? Hello. My name is Bob uh, Killen. I am known as Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. I am currently a OSS programming manager at Google's OSPO. Um, I come from an academic background where I was there, honestly, far too long. Um, but uh, for this, I am currently a member of the Kubernetes Steering and former chair of Kubernetes uh, SIG contributor experience. And for all this, though, probably the more relevant thing is, like, I have been a you know, an end user consumer, I've been a hobby contributor, I've been a maintainer, and now a corporate contributor. And I feel like on the stamp card of roles in open source, the only thing I'm missing is like being in a VC startup, um, which I don't necessarily want. But I bring this up um, because I have spent a lot of time wearing these different hats and have had to justify my own involvement or especially as, you know, a steering committee member in Contribex, help others justify theirs. Sorry. Um, it has given me a better understanding um, of the various like issues and various dynamics uh, at play in sort of the ecosystem and how all these things come together. And more importantly, how we surface value. Now, I generally like to say value over business value because there is so much sort of, I like to say, unrealized potential in projects that just exists already. Um, it's just not being surfaced well. But, you know, as we can sort of see here, most of the contributor base, at least within the CNCF, is contributing on behalf of an organization. Um, I, that might not necessarily be the case, like they might have a policy where they have to, you know, do stuff with their work email. Um, but in general, it, that is sort of the case. Also, I'm sorry for the green with the VMware thing that was auto chosen color by Google Slides. I tried to make it clear. <laughs> um, anyway, the interesting thing about this distribution is that it surprisingly carries over to the maintainers too. Um, I honestly wasn't expecting this for like the CNCF uh, contributions uh, to be so close to the percentage of maintainers. They're both roughly 95%. And this trend also extends beyond the CNCF a bit uh, to general open source these days. In a 2023 study asking what brings people to open source, 52% uh, contributed in both work and personal time, 30% contributed in professional time only, and only 18% contributed in personal time only. I know it's not a perfect representation um, of the, you know, doing it for work, doing it for personal balance, but it's still, you know, a, a, a pretty good, decent, like, approximate. Um, still, it means, you know, 82% of contributions are doing at least some contributions as um, on behalf of their employer. So the TLDR in all this is, so most uh, contributors are contributing on behalf of their organization. Um, and while this is anecdotal, I know there are studies out there that have backed this up. Don, I should have asked you for them. <laughs> um, most contributors like contributing to OSS and wish they could just, you know, spend more time doing it. Um, and ideally, that means they're also getting paid to do it. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, being a full-time maintainer, but at least getting some time and recognition for their work in open source. Um, you know, we, we also know that the businesses behind these projects, you know, for them to succeed, we want them to succeed so they can continue to pay um, maintainers and ideally hire more. Um, the hard part in all this is giving the business justification for it. So trying to explain business value can uh, feel like trying to connect a bunch of random dots together and lots of fuzzy, you know, connections and correlations. And the people listening to you, you know, honestly might think you're a bit crazy. Um, most of what we know is how to convey is like the general benefits 
um, like influence, uh, you know, reduction of risk, um, you know, the other benefits like retaining and attracting talent. Um, but that is not what most businesses, employers are looking for. They are looking, you know, how it works to support the business and the business's goals. Uh, they're a little more okay with letting people do OSS and, you know, have those fuzzy connections uh, to value when times are good, but times like now, um, where people are having to reprioritize and with cuts being made, uh, open source will be one of the first things to go unless you can actually convey how it supports the business. And more importantly, to tie like the upstream work to value. And for this, there's really like two standout areas that can kind of help. Um, those are data enablement and communication. Um, it could be, you know, presentation, it just sort of more so how we actually convey the information. Uh, but anyway, let's get on with the uh, data enablement. So the big problem is insufficient data in all of this. And I can, I, you know, I know some people might groan at this, um, but seriously, have you ever been pressed to give like more information about a project and you start looking at it and find it's freaking impossible to do without like a lot of manual collating of data? Um, I've been through a lot of these, you know, fire drills where it's like, we're presenting the leadership tomorrow, get us the data. And, you know, if the project hasn't been diligent with their triage, their labels and milestones, um, that request um, can go from, you know, a couple of hours of work to I'm brewing multiple pots of coffee and pulling an all-nighter. Um, and the state, that state of, you know, insufficient data is sadly much more common than you would think. So I looked at 12 CNCF projects uh, at random. I literally random number generator uh, and chose four projects from each tier. And frankly, it wasn't great. Um, six actually labeled their issues consistently. Only two labeled their PRs and only seven used milestones. Um, by the way, when I say labeled here, I'm talking like even basic labels like bug and feature or enhancement. You know, and I, I made sure to ignore things like Dependabot and all that, um, and things that you know would auto-merge. You know, what makes this even worse is I originally was only doing three projects from each tier, but literally didn't have any projects in the first nine that labeled their PRs. Um, I'm sorry if my frustration is coming through a bit, but seriously, like, it's hard to produce data in this kind of state. Like, it, it, it's maddening trying to go through, like, PR, BR, PR, PR by PR, issue by issue, trying to get an idea of what it actually is. Um, and these kind of labels, these things, it's a big portion of the stuff that's being used by businesses to justify investing in a project. Um, and, you know, ideally giving their employees more time to work in it and more time for them to be maintainers. Um, I did jump the gun a little bit on like labels and milestones without explaining why, but I wanna sort of like set the stage a bit before, you know, really, you know, exploring them. Uh, truly though, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, consistent and descriptive labels provide context right off the bat. Um, they help you prioritize and for, you know, this discussion, really help you track trends that are important to you and your organization. Fundamentally, they will help you answer questions and express change. Um, and with that, let's actually take a look at a couple examples really quick. Um, so with labels, you know, we can ask, how many bugs were in the Kubernetes 1.30 release? Boom, simple query. Uh, is PR, has a label kind bug, and is in the milestone 1.30. GitHub returns a quick, you know, answer of 180. Another example, how are we progressing on cleaning up tech debt in SigNode? And add the label SigNode and kind cleanup for labels and 71 right there. Now imagine trying to cross a whole bunch of things and, and try and figure it out manually. This, these things gives us things that we can track. And tracking is how we can show impact. Uh, 
in this question, has you know, Kubernetes stability improved over the past six releases or two years? Um, I ran the query for each version uh, on here to get you know, the number of you know, bug PRs. Um, and, you know, let's say you know, whoever, Google, whoever made a strong push to pay down bugs uh, after the rise in the you know, 1.27 release, well, the line going down is a nice way we can actually show that they have made an impact and have paid things down. Um, to, to continue with this, like, what if we, uh, if we want to ask specifically like target regressions? Easy enough, add a label. Or bugs for the API server, add a label. Or let's say you're you know, working on the team that owns Cube Proxy, boom, easy, add a label. I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing this but you have a metric you can use and show change and show impact. Um, and you've heard me talk about the label versus no label, but so now if you can really imagine doing all that work, crawling you know, thousands of issues and thousands of PRs, trying to do all that without labels and having to actually look at those things, no, just no. Um, in general, you won't, and you have to fall back to overall, you know, number like of PRs, velocity. Um, but the thing is, like that information is so much less meaningful when trying to show, you know, change in specific areas, change when you've made specific investments or initiatives in an area. And you can combine, you know, all the label filters with, you know, say author to get things you have, you know, personally done for you uh, to show your work. Or if like you have a small enough team, you can actually combine, you know, multiple authors in there and show the work done by the team and show it over time. And that is incredibly helpful. Uh, the next thing, um, you've already seen me use them, but really that's milestones, sorry. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on milestones, but I do want to highlight it. Um, you know, essentially they're a logical grouping of issues and PRs. When doing milestones, um, say by release, it's incredibly easy to you know quickly query the items that have gone into it. Um, you can sort of you know re re you can potentially replace that with date range um, in a GitHub query but you're going to get everything. And usually there's going to be multiple issues and PRs that are going to be targeting different releases or branches or whatever. And it's, it's not going to give you, you know, accurate data, you get everything. Um, so generally, as you might guess, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of milestones. Uh, so, Part of this is, you know, it begs the question, if labels and milestones are so useful, why don't more projects use them? Um, it's largely triage issues, uh, and a lot of projects, they, they just don't do it, or they don't do it consistently. They'll, they'll do it for a little bit, and then someone might get busy, and you have this big stream of, of stuff that comes in, and it doesn't get triaged. Um, but really, like I've spoken to a bunch of different people about why, and most of it boiled down to like a few things. Um, first, in like ye old GitHub days, uh, they did not have a role for triage. Um, to add labels and milestones, the person had to be granted write access to a repo. And you want to be very restrictive with that. So kind of understand why it, you know, they just didn't know, didn't progress. Um, the next one I think is an issue with sort of like understanding how they can actually be used. You know, some of the maintainers, they, they don't think this stuff actually matters. Um, if they have a, you know, perception that no one uses them, they aren't useful and just take, you know, more work for them to manage, why bother? You know, even if adding a label or milestone takes a few seconds tops, um, it can just feel completely unnecessary and a lot of work when you're burned out. Like, I know we've all been there at one point in our lives, like where something stupid and trivial is, you know, would actually be helpful to you, but for, for some reason, it is a mountain of work for you to actually get yourself to do it. Um, and that is, that is a problem. Uh, the, the last one is, you know, 
they thought their project was small, the, the maintainers of it were, you know, they all had enough context. And, you know, that can work, but what happens when they start to grow? And they start to actually need this stuff. Well, a lot of those old patterns of not labeling or milestoning anything just carry over and it, it becomes harder and they get in the state of like, why isn't anyone helping? Why isn't anyone seeing this stuff? Well, it's hard to actually surface that information. Now, all this said, there are some tools that can actually help make things easier. Uh, GitHub Actions has created a nice like ecosystem of things that can you know you can re reuse. Uh, I have on here uh, three actions that can help with labeling: uh, copy issue label, syncs issue labels to PRs, following like if someone says like fixed issue whatever, it will copy the labels from the issue over to the PR. You can also adjust keywords so that way it doesn't actually follow closed ones uh, or you know fixed fixes or some of those and it uses your own keyword. Um, you can um, sort of customize your own. Uh, pull request labeler, uh, labeler will automatically apply labels based on glob patterns. Uh, say you're working uh, out on a project with like different languages and you have different people triaging those. Um, you can have it label things like dot py with python or you know dot go with go um, or you know subdirectories uh, label syncer is just a nice little thing uh, they kind of uh, copied the what kubernetes uses for keeping track of all its labels all over the place like copy at least the, the the style format of them but it allows you to consistently have the same labels across like all your repos and the last one on here is you know add to get a projects um, Talking about projects a little bit more later, it is very flexible. It can help you create and manage multiple boards uh, for your own like triage purposes, um, and we'll yeah we'll explore those a little bit more in a bit. I definitely recommend checking it out though. Uh, the the next thing for those of you that aren't familiar, Prow is the CI system for Kubernetes. Um, it's also pretty much 100% label driven. In one thing like. Any project that I found randomly that was using Prowl, they were labeling everything correctly. So it's just sort of like that pattern carried over. Uh, there's also a Prowl GitHub action that basically copies a, a mimics a subset of the Prowl commands without having to actually run an instance of Prowl. So you can use you know the milestone, so it'll milestone stuff and labels for things. Um, it can also use a proven LGTM to, so it forces people to have two reviews before it merges. Um, all pretty useful stuff. Now, one other point on here that I don't have a slide for, uh, but I want to mention is triage is an excellent thing to actually like recruit people with a good knowledge of the project, but you know, might not have much coding skills. Uh, to help with, they usually have enough knowledge to be able to go through things and you know figure out like is this a what the root cause of the problem is and at least get it to the right team. Um, think like you know sysadmins. Uh, it's it's honestly like it's a very good non-code type role that you can use to recruit people. And if you do recruit some, uh, make sure that they actually feel recognized as a member of the project because this the. There's a lot of people that don't think that this kind of work is you know, necessarily important, but frankly, getting this stuff labeled is the way you get to justify your job and you continue to work on a project. So like, to me, that's pretty important. Now, the problem for most of this, especially for corporate maintainers, is why bother? Uh, they don't get recognition for their work. Management doesn't understand. They're told, uh, you know, to spend less time on the project uh, but still deliver features. Uh, why should they bother? Why should they triage? And the problem is that this can help them explain or justify their work and get that recognition. You know, I, I understand why they don't. They've lost sight of the fact that, you know, certain groups in their org want this kind of info. Um, and the thing is, is like the people that want that kind of info are usually the ones that can make resource adjustments. They're the ones that can help with headcount or allocate more time. And if you are, you know, presenting to leadership that you're, you know, 
various things like your time to resolve bugs is going, um, say, up along with the bug count, and it's taking longer to deliver your features, um, especially if it's like, you know, critical to your software stack, you start to, you know, increase the risk and you have, you know, potential justification for more time and or more people to help work on the project, especially, again, especially if it's critical to your infrastructure. Um, let's see. The other thing with all this, especially if they're giving you more time or assigning more people, they want to know that those extra resources were actually helpful, impactful. They want to know in six months that the bug count is going down or the state of the feature has gone from you know, red to green. You need some way of showing that information and just telling them that like, yep, it's good now or you know, we need more resources isn't going to cut it. You have to give them data. And this can give you some nice raw data to back it up. Okay, I've, I've ranted about labels enough. Um, let's dig into the second part of all this, and that is communication. Uh, metrics is great. It can give you some solid numbers to back up your org's investment, but your impact will likely go unrecognized if you don't provide some context and communicate it in the right way to the right audience. So explaining things, explaining things in a way that they care about. Um, so to sort of like get this section started off, I kind of want to go over a few of the players or you know, personas that we kind of see in all this. You know, we have our open source enthusiast. They're the ones who know how to navigate the you know, ecosystem. They could be a contributor, they could be a sysadmin, a developer. Uh, they could be doing it for work or hobby purposes. They're you know, happy to talk shop and get into technical discussions about stuff. And honestly, probably a large portion of us here today are probably fall into this category. Why would you be a coupon? <laughs> then we have our maintainer. Um, they're like the OSS enthusiast. Uh, they could be doing this as part of a job or hobby, but a good chunk of them are tired, under pressure to deliver. Some will spend you know, all hours of the day working on the project because they care about them. And most of them, in my experience, uh, I, I don't want to sound bad, but like aren't too keen on the whole project management type work. <laughs> Uh, they like coding and doing more of that, you know, deep technical work. Okay. So, next, <laughs> next we have our other sort of four big players. You know, leadership, the VPs, SVPs, C whatever. Uh, they're concerned with resources and the overall health of the company um, or, or, you know, greater org. They care about the health of the business. They're looking for opportunities and risks, and they are looking for return on investment, and they're also the least technical. Um, we also have product managers uh, who, you know, prioritize making the best product. Um, they're skilled at conveying technical details in user-friendly fashions, uh, but, and they desire, you know, customer user feedback, um, but tend to be like, a lot of them don't know open source very well. However, I will say there has been some amazing open source PMs that I've been lucky to know. Uh, next, we have our managers and leans who are you know, concerned about um, their employees and meeting you know, their OKRs, uh, better understanding. They have a better understanding of tech um, than like leadership, um, but they have a, a you know, good idea of the teams and, and prioritizing, you know, a smaller set of objectives. Uh, sorry. Uh, then we have our end users, um, and, you know, they are pri prioritizing how tools, features, things like that work for them. You know, what, what can they use in their environment? Um, there's a diverse set of technical skills, but still, you know, we're, we're, we're all at a point in our lives where we, uh, where a lot of things are going for our attention. So you, you, you really need to, if you want to like attract users or reach, reach them well to, you know, talk about things in a very clear, concise manner, uh, TLDR everything. <laughs> um, 
the big thing with like all of this and going forward is if it takes like unnecessary cognitive overhead to actually like understand the basic terms of what a project does, find your roadmap, um, or like, you know, look at the various like initiatives you're working on and know what uh, parts of the project, the features and initiatives are at risk, you are losing out significantly. You are losing potential users, future contributors, and you are making it more difficult for yourself to justify further investment of resources. So I wanna talk, I wanna go over a few examples of this kind of language stuff that I'm talking about. Um, so please raise your hand if you understand what this is about. I'll give it another minute. Exactly. This was the user-friendly version, by the way, <laughs> in the description of this feature. But you know, who would understand that enough on first reading to know, you know, you uh, to try it out and provide feedback? Now try giving that description to like you know your VP. That's you know not going to go over very well. Um, so this is the final version that actually made it on the public website. And, you know, actually, who has a better idea of what this does now? Please raise your hand. Yeah, significantly better. Um, so this, this is honestly actually where, you know, PMs can be very helpful in trying to break down the technical version of that mess and get it into a more user-friendly fashion. Um, the other thing is like with all this, it's, yeah, it, it, part of the way to like encourage PMs to work on this stuff is like getting feedback in the OSS version is earlier than, you know, trying to get it in the, you know, product that you're delivering. So there's a chance to actually get things better down the line. So let's look at the next example. So I'm not going to bother asking people to uh, raise their hand on this one, but you, you, you get the idea. Again, this is the user-friendly version. <laughs> and, and this is the version that I wrote after, after reading this. Um, these are both from Kubernetes. I don't want to throw shade towards you know, other projects, but when showing these examples, uh, I can promise you it's, it's not an uncommon thing. I, I saw examples like this in every project I looked at. Um, so, a lot of this stuff was actually, you know, really targeted towards other maintainers and other technical people. Uh, but the problem is, is these people also desire feedback from uh, users also early on, early on in all this. You know, when, you know, features are alpha, when they think they can actually make changes. I'm, I'm sorry, but very few users are ever going to provide feedback if you're giving them these kinds of descriptions. Um, the other thing is, like, if you're having to report uh, on the status of this thing internally to, say, multiple groups, which is going to be easier to understand by that larger group of people? Okay. Yeah. Now, it's, the other thing is, like, it's not just how we say this stuff, but also how we surface this information. Um, so in, in including the you know, projects I like randomly selected, I did look at others, and only a tiny hand, handful of them had like easily discoverable information about what the project was working on, things like design proposals or even you know feature tag issues. Um, like there were some blog posts and links. Um, there were a few roadmaps that I found, but like it, if it takes me more than 15 minutes of digging and me being an experienced person in all this. That's a problem. So this isn't just a like user problem, but if I or a PM, you know, wanted to give a status update on, you know, and trying to dig this stuff out and put it together, that's a problem. And I'm not here to just complain. I, there are some options to, you know, make this better, like publishing a release report with a bunch of information or an annual report. Um, but let me actually tell you about my favorite thing that I've really come to know and love, and that's GitHub project boards. Thanks, Kubernetes Enhancements Board. Um, I really like the new GitHub project boards for surfacing information in friendly, flexible ways, because uh, 
Also, like these days, I never look at the Kanban version. I only ever look at the table version. They're very easy to automate and can have, you know, selective uh, field population based off, you know, label or milestone. You can have different views of the data to cater to like different groups uh, in your project for, you know, general consumption. And, you know, the, the most important thing to like PMs, managers, whoever, is it's actually exportable to TSV and it's very easy then to import into, um, into like essentially like Excel or Sheets. Okay. I need to speed this along. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you can also use them uh, at, like, as a roadmap to get like a general status update. I just use this as an example. It's very easy. So like you can have a published view, parse a field in your issue template, and populate that, that description with that you know, actually user-friendly version that I, I, I showed. And being able to put all this information in one place in a very consumable way um, is very, very, like, I don't, I don't want to say impactful, but like, it's very useful. Um, you can give users access to it. It's one roadmap. Um, and like, just being able to import it, you can relate it to like internal initiatives really easily. Honestly, it, it's, it's really nice. Um, I do want to cover about talking to leadership a little bit, but uh, I think, most of this will actually be covered in the uh, examples that I'm going to cover here in a sec, and I want to talk about those, so I'm going to fast forward through this slide. I'm sorry. Uh, all my notes are in here. I'll show that after the class. Uh, same thing with this. Okay, so now the fun part. Um, these are a couple stories based on true events. Um, these are based off discussions that I've had. Um, I fudged some of the numbers a little bit, but to keep, just to keep it like generally anonymous, but they're close enough and the actual outcomes are real. So let's talk about the troubled end user. I was connected with a end user company that was contributing to several open source projects. Uh, they were even maintainers of a few, um, but they were you know, getting significant pressure from above them to basically cut back and drop, uh, either drop their contributions fully or cut back significantly because they couldn't show the impact of their work. So I had a long talk with them. I asked them, you know, what they had done previously and what they had reported to leadership. Um, they listed out, you know, what they used, what they contributed to. They pulled some stuff from like dev stats, like their presence, their contributions, things like that. They also, in, you know, included a list of, you know, the features and things that they were driving upstream and using. But they were not giving leadership what they actually wanted. This is a trap I see people fall into often. They can, you know, give them, you know, information that's easily to get, like, from dev stats, which is generally great and easy to, for us to, like, produce. But they didn't think about what the driving motivator was behind this and didn't think about what, you know, didn't think uh, they could gather the kind of information that leadership actually wanted. Um, so we went back and talked about like risks and opportunities. Uh, we they need to think about stuff from leadership's point of view. Uh, they need to provide them um, with how is the project benefiting the company? Uh, is it critical to their stack? What is the risk if the project goes you know unmaintained? Uh, what is the company getting from its people being maintainers? How much uh, time are they actually investing in these projects? And that is the kind of information that you know, leadership wants. They, they don't necessarily care too much about the technical details. They want to know, like, sweet hours and things like that. Um, so this is the stats from one of the projects they were maintaining. Uh, I like bug fixes a lot because it relates to overall stability and something like everyone understands. So in the previous year, there were 55 total bugs. 11 of them were submitted by this team. Only six of the 11 were fixed by uh, people of the same team. And um, the mean time for those fixes to be reviewed and merged was three days, which was actually much shorter than the, t the time was to get things merged internally. And like, that's pretty freaking fast, especially, yep, uh, with almost half the bugs that aren't actually getting fixed by you. Uh, so we, we knew 
leadership was concerned with sweet time, so I asked them seriously, how much time do they spend on the project in a given month? It turns out it actually wasn't a lot, about 10%. Uh, the reason for this is like a lot of small amounts where like they might have like one part where they're doing four to an eight hour block. Um, so essentially for you know the cost of half a SWE, they got the features they wanted delivered, they, ha they had their bugs fixed, and they did this like, th this is the kind of thing that they you know, really, really liked, and they did this kind of you know, analysis for a bunch of their projects. Um, in the end, they gave leadership a big spreadsheet, they included you know, critical criticality, they had their SWEs estimate time per project, and you know, it's not great, but they tried. Um, leadership really liked it. And from their view, investing an overall small amount of yearly SWE time was ensuring the service stayed up and stable, bugs could be fixed quickly, and honestly, from the bugs fixed, features delivered, and looking at overall activity versus their investment, it was a very good ROI, which is what they want. Um, and it's that kind of messaging that has landed with leadership every time I have been in one of these engagements where I've talked to a group and tried to help them go through this kind of problem. Um, we are very much out of time, so I'm just going to uh, like jump over this really quick. There was a struggling maintainer. They were the only one left. They never surfaced the problem, helped them surface that problem to you know, a lot, put an issue template, PR template, um, actually went out and talked to like their boss and other companies that had an investment, were able to get those other companies to, you know, help, sorry, um, invest people time into it because uh, we were able to get the maintainer uh, block time to actually, you know, mentor these people into becoming new maintainers. And one of the, the, the great outcomes in all this is that uh, once the, the maintainer's company understood the risk and the, they had a single point of failure, they actually put another person in this whole mentoring cohort thing. So they actually, like, it, it was enough of a motivator for them to add another person and, and like, again, de-risk their own usage by getting rid of a single point of failure as well as, you know, bootstrapping a bunch of other people. So this is really only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to thinking about the you know, business value of open source and how to justify these things. Like I haven't touched on KTLO, keep the lights on, fitting overall project health into this, justifying improvements to documentation and other non-code work, but it's a start. Again, I've had to cram this into 35 minutes and I'm already going over time, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you know, we can encourage more users and larger diverse pool, pools of uh, co contributors if we can surface the innate value that already exists in these projects. We can help organizations understand the impact of their contributions, impact of their investments, and by being able to convey, um, explain the impact of these investments, it creates uh, the business justification to contribute, to hire contributors, to grow more maintainers, and create more sustainable ecosystems. Okay, thank you for listening to me like ramble on for 30 minutes. Um, if you'd like to chat, I can be reached by, okay, cool, yep, uh, reach by email, LinkedIn, whatever. Uh, also to, happy to chat after this. Um, Last thing, and you know, metrics related, if you could, uh, please leave feedback. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people about this topic, but this is actually the first time I've put a deck together. I already know I kind of need to cut this down to fit it into this time slot uh, to be a bit more effective. But uh, yeah, please let me know if there's anything you think I could do better. Thanks.